So we are here tonight to kind of vibe with Larry Rushy. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Larry during one of our other shows, and that's how we got acquainted. Um, I was invited to the studio, and I have to say I was very intrigued. <laughs> and I said, yes, you know, let's, let's, let's put on a show. So, you know, I just want this to be a very relaxed um, kind of dialogue, kind of picking, picking Larry's brain a little bit or just finding out more about it. So, um, for me, uh, and I, has everybody read um, Larry's bio? Um, I can share a little bit of that. Um, Larry Rushing was born in rural Georgia, delivered and raised by his great-grandmother, the local midwife. He moved to the inner city of Miami as an adolescent and moved to New York City after completing his MFA at Tyler School of Art, Temple University. Rushing's work is currently exhibited at the Dayton Art Institute. Well, this is, um, is this current stuff? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, AABHG Black Heritage, your visual rhythms exhibit. He has shown widely in New York City as part of the Federation of Modern Painters and Sculptors and other galleries and virtually through the Arts Unite groups, Lights to Connectors, Fragmentation Rhythm, Vibration, a solo show exhibited at the O'Kane Gallery, University of Houston downtown. Uh, welcome, Olivia. Hello. <laughs> um, so before um, I start um, uh, asking or touching base with Larry, I, I want to also just give credit um, to Karen Fitzgerald for her beautiful essay, which I am a word person. I love to read. And um, I, I love the way she uh, described the work. And I just wanted to point out one of my favorite lines in the description. Um, I love graphically the archetype of femaleness, the vulva, often takes center stage. This is not the vulva that the patriarchy loves for. Rather, it is the vulva as an entrance to the cave of creation. The place of beginnings. I love that. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was like she's not here. Of creation. Yeah. We got. Not kind of nice. Otherwise, okay. well, um, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so. I, um, I guess as a programmer, I may have different pro uh, questions than um, artists or, um, you know, just, just people interested in art have. And so one of the questions um, that I have is, uh, how do you cultivate a collector base? Uh, it's, it's one of the... um, kind of like uh, cultivate a collective space of my work. Yeah. Basically, that's what you're asking. Uh, well, I don't, honestly, I don't know. What I'm trying to do is formulate that as we speak. And I think, from what I understand from my studies in grad school and transversing the universe out there to sidewalk, et cetera, it's done by introducing your work and finding somebody or someone such as yourself who understands your message. Mm. And that is then perpetuated through conversations, conversations, etc. And once you can find that big list and then, then begin to spread. Uh, I've had a little bit of success with that via one of my, co uh, my graduate colleague and he uh, he got me to show in Houston and started me on my way of people that seeing and understanding my work. And then, of course, I've just been that's showing it around. I mean, I have a collector, um, Mr. Abrahams in Florida, he did collect a uh, piece of my work. And then I have one in Texas, gentlemen collected a couple of pieces of my work. So it's just about word of mouth and conversation, like, like the dialogue that you and I are gonna have with these people here. And I had the one in Texas, the way he came about it is that uh, I had gone to one of my professors, so, Ex exhibitions, and I was asking him the question that you posed to me, and he politely pulled me over to the corner and told me, he says, listen, Mary, I don't even want to 
be here. I don't really talk to you about art or anything else. And he says, I just want to go paint, so I really can't help you. Oh, oh, so, okay. I said, okay, wait, wait, I think you not know. And I went off and I told that story at a party, and the gentleman later on, about two years later, called me and said, listen, send me some, send me some of your work. And he started thinking. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what stands out for me is relationships, <laughs> right? Yeah. That a lot of it, you know, is just making, you know, those connections. And, and I would say that Larry's charm, you know, and a smile, I, I, I have a little to do with, you know, uh, you know connection. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just find on, on a serious note that it's, um, it's a great challenge for artists um, to develop a collector base. And I have to say, if you have one, you know, I, I, I you know, congratulations, right? Yeah. Because um, it takes years, I think, um, and a lot of consistency um, to develop that. So some people, I think, um, don't ever achieve that. And it, it doesn't, uh, it's not a reflection of success or not success. It's just, um, um, it's an averaging um, thing to do. I think it, there's an art in it of itself. <laughs> um, are, are you saying that this is the, uh all your work is just this style of work, but that there's no other... I'm going to open it up for questions. Oh, okay. Done. Thank you. I'm not sure how you mean Yeah, that. yeah. It's just one, one, one. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Um, so anyway, yeah. So, you know, that's it's a challenge. So I can mention yeah. on having any collector. <laughs> um, now, we all know that the female genitalia <laughs> yeah. depicted in art um, directly or indirectly can be controversial um, for the ones presenting it, you know, as, um, you know, the overseer of spaces and the one who uh, creates the work, right? So um, how do you deal uh, or, and have you dealt with any controversy about how your work is perceived? Yeah, I am. Uh, well, <laughs> how do I deal? I don't know. Over here, it took me about Honestly, I guess it took me about 10 years to own that. Uh, when I first uh, saw my first new bottle, I was I was so embarrassed, I went to the rehab room and I, and I, I drew the chair that she was sitting in. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, as time went on, and over a period of time, and over uh, years, I uh, began to realize, well, what, what brought me to that, to that whole process was basically that I um, I wanted to honor my great grandmother, and I needed to to figure out a way to honor her. And I don't have any pictures of her, and I can't continue to you know draw pictures over and over and over her. And then so what I did is I went back to my art history book, and then I. Just, decided that I had to come up with a philosophy and I knew it was going to be about my great grandmother. And so she was, if an entity arrived, came into my head and I was like, okay, it's going to be coming up. How am I going to deal with that? And I'm going to deal with it. Then I went back and examined myself into this time and owned it. I said, okay, well, how do you deal with an entity, the universality of an entity, not just a but the whole universe? So I said, okay female genitalia, be it insects, animals, whatever, it's still femininity. And it's all that particular point. And that's just, when I'm doing this, then I can know. I can know my great-grandmother. And I got pushback. I got a lot of pushback. Yes, and I was embarrassed at times. But then after a period of time, you just kind of like, you either own it or you run. Well, she said it took you 10 years. Yeah, it took me about 10 years to own it, to truly own it. I mean, I make jokes about it, laugh at it, make oh. fun of myself about it, kind of show it, be shy, and withdraw, and stuff like that. But after a period of time, he says, look, you're either going to do it, or you're not going to do it. I guess I went back to my marine training, and says, okay, you got to make a decision. You need to go, so you're going to die. So, so how do you, um, and maybe I'm not using the right word, but how do you defend it, right? Or how do you... Um, how do you, uh, when I say it could be controversial, um, 
there are some people, um, Jenny, I'm sure just, yeah. you know, how they, you know, their perception of art, right? Like right. they say, it's, you know, yeah. it's subject to interpretation. So how do you, politely or not politely, how do you, uh, or have you ever had to deal with that? Like, have you not had to, um, you know, maybe it's, the answer is, uh, I don't say anything. No, 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 no. I have, I have, to, I have to defend it, and I have had, but I just uh, attack it from straight on. It says, uh, it, which can't be denied. Femininity is the universal source of beauty. I mean, you know, from, from and if we get in an argument with me, and we get long enough, I say, well, it's you know, it's like your mom. It's <laughs> your mom, and you're always trying to get back to. Bottom line, <laughs> <laughs> it's rather backwardly put, but when you think about it, then it is. And then, then how can you argue that femininity is the power that is responsible for all our being? So now, if you can get beyond that patriotic ethos that you're you're presenting in a negative manner, and realize the elegance and the beauty of what I'm trying to talk about, then maybe we can have a conversation. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well defended. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, because even um, as someone who holds space for, for art, that, that, you know, it's depicting uh, female genitalia, uh, even I am, uh, you know, something, oh, is that all right? Is that appropriate for children or, you know, the kids in here? Um, and I have to be honest, I haven't, um, you know, with all the hats I wear, I still haven't figured out, you know, what is the right answer, you know, because in, in my head, I'm, you know, I'm probably saying that's ignorant, like, um, and if, you know, if it's offensive to you, then don't look at it and don't enter the space. Uh, but that's just me, you know, kind of being icy and spicy. Um, and I would, you know, I'm, uh, I really asked you that question so that I can take some of what you're saying, how you defend to kind of, um, you know, uh, learn a little more about what is the best way. Because um, I don't want to feel like I'm defending the art that, that is here. I, I appreciate so much, you know, the um, that they're, um, you know, that it's on these walls and uh, and that it's, um, you know, it's this diverse uh, art. Um, you can't always show the same thing. I think that's what art is all about. And uh, and I, I love your you know, your answer. And uh, I, I get it. And I hope to articulate it just as well as you did. If anybody else before it's um, asked. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you one more thing and then I'm going to open it up. Um, what do you know today about art or the art world that you wish you had known um, years ago? What I know, oh, I wish I had known that, um, well, honestly, I wish that I had, um, I wish I had been taught when I was in grad school that art, that, it, that you needed to formulate your philosophy on it, stand by it, and project it into the world, regardless of what the feedback is. Mm -hmm. And today I know that and this is what I do, and I, and I do it without any hesitation. But, but coming to that point, because having to deal with that overall pushback from the, from the universe, it causes you also to question what you're doing. And that was, too was a part of my being. I was questioning why am I making it? And then I had to figure out a reason why I was making it. Then I know why I'm making it. Now, why is it worth making for the for the people to see it? Then I had to get a reason why it was worth making for me. And so it's worth making for me because I'm honoring my great grandmother, who was the midwife, who brought me, helped bring me into the world, and was responsible for my being here. And so it's like, it's irrelevant. If you get it, good. If you don't, right. oh, excuse right. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a rather grass way of putting it, but you have to have that kind of thick skin in order to uh, 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 withstand these pressures that you're going to be confronted with out in the world. And I, I haven't even begun to face them. I mean, I know that they're, you know, there are a lot more to come, but uh, I think my, I got this, I got the armor on now. It doesn't matter. And I, I, there was a gentleman who, who uh, I was involved with for a period of time, and he says, uh, 
what are you going, what, are, what do you want to do? What in five years would you want to be in? I said, a better artist. So, you know, 20 years from now from living, I want to be a better artist. Whether anybody gets it or not, it's irrelevant. Right. Because I'm doing what I really need to do, which is honor femininity, which is my great grandmother and all the women that are in our existence. Mm -hmm. And I'm sending my message, hopefully you get it. But if you don't, you know, that's beyond me. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It kind of, uh, you know, now perfectly into what I'm trying to have before, which is, was there, uh, were there threats of work that you were doing that were not trying to conform to what people were trying to tell you versus saying, I want to follow this the team that I feel like, are there, are there threats of your work? Obviously, this has been the edited selection of your work. So I can imagine that there's path that you took, but you kind of said, you know, when you kind of felt like you were accommodating them rather than yourself. That, yeah, I, 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 I think I get the question that you're asking, what came before this? Right, right. <laughs> okay, and, and what came before this was uh, my, well, first of all, I, I, where I studied, I didn't have a choice. I mean, I studied, I came out, I'd like to say I come out of the old academy. That being that, you know, the Renaissance, uh, you know, all the way down to the Impressionists, et cetera. You had, the schools that I went to, you, know, you had to be able to draw. You had to be able to render. You had to be able to show perspective. You had to be able to make a design clearly stated. They would ball up a piece of paper and throw a bottle on the table and broken glass and say, draw that. And you need to make that look like that on your two-dimensional surface when it looked in 3D. Once you did that, they didn't have any argument about whatever it is you wanted to do. But you couldn't do what you wanted to do until you could prove you could do that. And so, yeah, that was my way. And I started out by painting lamps, cameras on the table. I have an old picture where I have this lamp with the camera and the slides and projectors and all that stuff. That's when I realized that I could paint. And of course, you know, it took me some years to the tactical yeah. part of what you were fighting. Exactly. Fundamental. What you wanted to do. Exactly. And still what you were still wanting. To do. Right, right. I had to master the fundamentals first. Once I mastered the fundamentals, I went back to the history books, decided what I wanted to do with it, and tried to figure out what the statement I wanted to make. I had to go back and do a little more research, and I came up with the philosophy, and then I'm off and I'm even getting a, a sense of uh, different ages of these different yeah, oh, yeah. Like, I, I'm getting the sense of the one with the city. Those are the latest. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I hear to my rear yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh -huh. rooftop. Well, now you're getting into a, 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 a variation which is fairly new for me, basically, is that I'm trying to also incorporate my upbringing and my existence on this earth. And that is, I have two, uh, two extremes. I, I was born in a rural country backwoods, nearest town, 25 miles, which had one store, a jailhouse, a bank, and that was it. That was our town. And then I was dropped into the inner city, where I thought food fair was the city. I mean, so you how naive I was, and so that was the shock. So now I have these two contrasting points of view that are embedded in me, and now I utilize that to express to formulate the design. And all the way it's work, it all works together. Yeah. That's yeah. why it's perfect. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so I'm contrasting rural opposed to the urban. Femininity goes everywhere, so I don't have to question that. Well, you're also saying things like the city itself is organic. Like you're talking about like, there's a nature around us, even though we create. Absolutely. So even though we come from nature, we're also creating our own nature. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, there is. I mean, you, uh, you, this is why the bricks come in to play a lot. I mean, if you saw some of my other works, you, you see you see the wheels and stuff. But then, you know, we can get into the fundamentals, and I can tell you about techniques and where I, who I stole from and who I was borrowing and who I'm trying to and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Sure. So I have a question about, um, so the thing I love about your paintings is the color is so striking. Mm -hmm. What do you... How do you go about your color selection? And like, is there a process? Is there a like mindset 
Yeah, there is. There is. There's two answers to that question. There's an A and a B. A is that you need to understand color and the basic fundamentals of color. You know, primary, secondary, tertiary. That's you know basic. Once you go beyond that, then you got to decide where you want to land on that color wheel. You know, of course, you know, I like the tertiary. I'm out there on the river. And then once you, once you get there, you got the fundamentals of the color. What I do now, I go try to access, I try to do what Andre Breton talked about, who was the poet philosopher who headed the surrealist movement. Of course, you know Dolly. I say surrealism, you think of Dolly. <laughs> but they weren't the fathers, they were just the components and work with the subconscious and I, and I, and I like to think that uh, my color is my anima inside of my existence. I feel like I know I'm a man, but I think there's a, another little part in there somewhere and I try to reach in there and touch that where I'm dealing with the color. And, and, and the people that influence me is Kandinsky, uh, Stuart Davis, you know, that kind of people like that. Uh, and there are others. Yes. So I just noticed the edges of your canvas, and I love that you paint them as part of the painting. So I just, that's a side. But my question is I noticed in a lot of the paintings similar objects like the stem glasses <laughs> and the shoes and the plants. And I was wondering what these it's things special. symbolize to you, or do they each have a meaning? Is this a vocabulary you've developed? or? Yes, they do. Each item means something to me. I, I, uh, I love glass. I like when I didn't. Well, where I was born, we had mason jars. So that's all I knew. But when I came to the city, I discovered glass, and I discovered that there was a difference in glass, crystal, opposed to the regular standard glass. And so I fell in love with that, and I started playing around with it and using pencils and catching the light on it and seeing what happened and stuff, you know, as I was formulating my still life. So glass to me has an elegance and it, and it, and it also has a masculine side. It's elegant when you have champagne and you're sipping and you're holding the distillettes and, and the cigars or whatever. It can be nasty when it's sharp and you hit it the wrong way and it cuts. So that to me is elegance. You know, you have to have the respect. So I use glass as, and also the second layer aspect of that question, the answer to that question, is the transparency. I can see through it. Now I like the uh, refraction, the not reflective, but fracturing of objects when you look through the glass to see it on the other side, and you can see it, like if, uh, say I put a pencil in, in this glass, inside it's crooked, outside it's straight. And I love that, and I found that still interesting. So that that endeared me to glass. But I came across glass because I found this elegant crystal glass that was cracked in a, a flea market, and they gave it to me for a dime, and I took it back home and I painted it, and I did really start playing with glass. I hit a big, deep glass, and it would rain different. I hit a crystal, and it sounded, oh, but there is a thing. <laughs> well, when do we drink out of crystal glasses on the bar? <laughs> you know, and so, yeah, the glass is there. So, but then it also represents a certain amount of feminine, femininity to be feminine. You know, it's um, what's more elegant than a glass of champagne in a lady's hand, and she's leaning back with an evening dress. You know, and the moment I think about glass, I think about okay, the elegance of a evening of a party or. It's, some kind of, so it, that feeds into it and the other things the light bulb is just just the fact that it is now if you get into the light bulb aspects of it, all the broken glass then i'm trying to replicate something i stole from the from the uh, cubist movement picasso that angularity you know that sharp angle yeah and then you get that organic line that the glass takes when it breaks according to its surface it's, it's weakness which you can't dictate, and I, then I say, okay, that's my spot to live. And I, and I dare myself to argue that, because I paint from life, and I try to justify everything that I'm doing, and how I go about doing it. So if I'm using an object, then I'm representing it as it is. I try to justify it being what it is and how it is. And the shoes? The shoes? The shoes? The shoes? 
the stiletto shoes? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the lady when I get by my <laughs> Yes, please. I have a question. I don't exactly know how to phrase it, but in other cultures, of, you know, where um, the vulva when the parts um, are not taboo and they are here, you know, you've got like the, the yoni in India where you yeah. rock with the vulva and the Tibetans celebrate it and Africans do in different ways. And it's a symbol basically of fertility, sexuality, and also the mystery of, of, of you know, a, 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 a woman and, and what happens. So, I sort of see that in your work, but I see more the um, the fragmentation of maybe today's femininity or sexuality. I mean, I, I, I don't I don't actually know what I'm asking. <laughs> I think I got to get where you're going. You know, just kind of like observing and trying yeah. to put it together because the way you break up the canvas into, you know, here, there, back, way back there, mm -hmm. up front is kind of interesting. And I don't actually know how to read that. I think you've got to spend a whole lot of time with it. Right. And, and how that relates to the, you know, the majestic concept of, you know, feminine sexuality. Okay. Yeah. Do you got, you got to get the, okay. One reason the fragmentation is, is basically in the sharp angles is to create the mute, the linear part, the improvisational rhythm. Now you get to another layer of my work. My work, I also, music is important to me. Jazz, improvisational rhythm. Rhythms, rhythms, in, you have to have rhythms in paintings, whether you know it or not. And where it's exemplified or it's stagnated, it's there. It has to be there because you play off the negative and positive space depending on the arrangement of the objects within the, comp within the context of the composition, of the design. So now my fragmentation is broken sharp angles opposed to organic curves is to get you to perceptually travel. Take this roadmap and take this trip with me so that I don't bore you before I can get you to take a look at the boat. That's basically what that's all. It seems like it's kind of hidden, but if I slapped it out there, point blank in your face, you got it, bam, out of it. <laughs> 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 you know, but then if I make you dance with me and stroll with me, it's just like I, I, I was at, um, if, if I make you dance and stroll with me, you might take a second look and then you might think that, well, he's not too bad. It is. It is a seduction. Exactly. And then you get in there and then hopefully you discover it. Yeah. You kind of hinted at it, but I would love to hear a little bit more about how music like, and jazz influences and is an influence in your art. Okay. Well, my, my, my uh, major uh, people that I love is Charlie Parker, Ornette Coleman, Miles Davis, uh, you know, Frank Morgan, you know, these guys who go off the rips. I mean, it's a mathematical structure. I can't break it down for you because I couldn't sing if I had to. Okay, but I love listening to it and what it, what it does is that rips that those, those um, like if you listen to Miles Davis, he kind of blue. Here's a good one, kind of blue. Anybody, every time you hear kind of blue, it's different, but you know who it is. Yeah. And that, and, and everybody improvises on it, but it still remains kind of blue. Well, I want my paintings to always be still lives. So through the, through what you bring to, to the canvas as you view it, as to what I'm offering you, then you can, it can accommodate you, you can accommodate it, and through that process, can only attain, you can only attain that by the rhythm 
And if the rhythm is an improvisational rhythm, it allows you the time and space to inject your thing while you would accept its thing and they both kind of stroll together. And so that's why I come up with this thing about jazz and improvisational rhythm. And, the, and I can exemplify that through the linear qualities by the angularity that I stole from the pubis movement and the organic feelings that I discovered through Dolly's stuff. I hope I answered the question. Yes, sir. That yeah. the pearl variety is shaped like that? I'm sorry? That why the pearl variety is shaped like that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's always a reason. Yeah. But it's like I said, I try to paint in life and I justify what I do. I try to always justify what I do. And then, of course, you know, I exaggerate a little bit. A little bit. We all do. I mean, tell the story. The whole ride is the one that's like the contortionist right there. The Brian Pearls. He's talking about that. That's kind of that kind of cubist. Kind yeah, of yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 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 That's the, in actuality, that's when I was really coming out the closet. <laughs> coming out the closet. Oh, really? Own it. Yeah. yeah I, okay, a story Why about that image. My story about that. The reason that uh, that image was uh, came out of. Uh, uh, I had a professor, oh, I was, got my degree at the University of Miami, Carl Gables, and I had a professor come down from Yale University to do an a, a, a art study program there for two weeks or whatever. And he was the reason I got accepted to Tyler. I went to Tyler. I was told that he was the reason I was accepted there. I went up to Yale to thank him. And he says, oh, Larry, you get to see you, blah, blah. What you doing? I said, I'm working here. Sure. He said, go do some drawings. Do some big drawings. And I got in the car and came back to uh, New York. And I was like, you know, well, I won't tell you what I was saying. But anyway, we got back and I did some big drawings. And I said, well, I would do big drawings because I was doing them small and tight because I hadn't come out of the closet. I said, well, he wants to see what I'm drawing. I'm, I'm going to continue to draw, so I'm going to make it big. And so that's when I made that big, and after that, the whole plug game. So. That's an amazing professional revolution. Yeah, that's that's how Pride and Pearls came about. That's when I was coming out of the closet. I owned it at that point. But you're, rec you're, you're accepting yourself at the same time. Absolutely. Your work. Absolutely. And yeah. the only reason I did it is because he slammed me. <laughs> <laughs> Ballsy. You showed him. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's, that, was my, that was my thumb, my middle finger. You don't think I. Anybody else? How long ago was that? Uh, that was 2000 and what, about seven or six or something like that? Yeah, way back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, did I, oh please, Mary. That's kind of a silly comment, but I've always noticed it about your painting. You do feet really well. <laughs> do you enjoy painting feet? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I love feet. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm trying to remember the artist's name. When I was uh, in my uh, sophomore year in college, uh, there was this artist, and he used to draw feet and hands. And that's all he drew. I can't, I mean, that's unfortunate. I can't remember. And I fell in love with that because I could always draw the feet and not show it and feel good about it because nobody really paid too much attention. And so I became good at that, and then as I got good at that, I moved into other things. But yeah, the extremities are very exciting to me. The bigger they are. I don't use them as much as I used to because I substitute with other things, but, you know, yeah. I've always loved that chasing up in there. Yeah, yeah, chained a lot. I was looking up that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I have, I have another uh, curiosity. With, sure. the, with the many layers of your paintings, of uh -huh. of your paintings, I wonder, when do you know it's finished? Well, what I do is I work on three paintings at a time. And I start, and I just rotate the painting. My mind becomes um, 
Well, you look at something for so long, you can't no longer really see it. So, what for me? And then I'll just turn it around and work on the second painting until I get that point, and then I go to the third one, and then after a period of time, I go back to the first one. And it's a fresh. It's just like if you look at your computer or you do something so long, you need to get up and take a walk. Just give the brain a chance to reassess. And, and I do that. Well, what my paintings is that I do this over a period of time, and I wound up figuring it out. It takes me about three months to do three paintings. And it gets to a point where I, I like to think that I'm communicating with the painting and we're talking. Because at some point in the painting, I no longer make decisions, I just follow the rhythm of the painting. And when I can no longer follow the rhythm of the painting, then I have to get off of it. And I was talking to some friend of mine and they said, well, what makes you stop? I said, when the painting tells me to get off. <laughs> and that's basically what it does. You know, I get, there is nothing else I can do. There is no other place I can find, make a change. There is not, and it's just like, it's, Go somewhere else, man. We're done here. Yeah, we're done here. And I, then I started with canvas on the side, and we can continue working on those two and get the third one going, and then, and then just wow. keep transversing all the way around. Continue. That's rhythm. That's rhythm. That's way. So, yeah, it's a continuum. Yes? How did you get there? Like, how did you come to accept your frustrations? How did I come to accept? Your frustrations. And, oh, but, oh. And then learning to give yourself the time and, and knowing when, when enough is enough. Like, uh, uh, well, I don't know if I truly, really uh, accept my frustration. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes get frustrated and I tell you, I swear, keep the wall, throw it in against the wall. And sometimes I've torn pieces up and just slammed it. I slam the door and go out to Central Park and run around and swear and let us try and come back and try again. I mean, I don't think that you can ever really get past that. And I think that's an exciting part because I think what that frustration that you're talking about and that I think you're talking about, it, which I experienced, is that you're peeling back the layers of an onion. You try to get to the core and it's just not ready to come down and you just got to take your time or if you can't get it off, just wait a minute and you figure out an angle and you go back and tear it and try it again. I use the, uh, I take charcoal. I go into a painting and it'll be there and if I can't, I look at it for a week or so and it's not moving. I hit it with the charcoal and stomp on it and scream and start all over again. I mean, Cezanne just throw up, tear them up. I mean, you know, I'm not the only artist, there are a lot of artists, they just rip it apart. I mean, you, you just got to work through it. You just work through it. And, uh, and you'll find that later on, if you do it enough, now I, I look for it. Because when I hit that point in my painting, in a painting, then I'm getting, it's getting good because it's about to open up. It's about to say yes, <laughs> you know. All the other time they say no, get off, you don't know what you're doing. But when you get there, it's about to say yes. And if you can make it through that, then you, all you have to do is follow the rhythm and it, the painting will develop itself. Thank you. Thanks. I think. <laughs> 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 Are you working on anything new? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm working right now. And I'm trying, I'm try, I painted, yes, I painted two mediums, water-based and oil. The water-based, I do acrylic and gouache. And I usually use gouache and acrylic mostly for experimenting because of the dry, drying process. Oil never really dries, and it takes so long to get to a point where you can call it dry. And, and oil is, Forgiving, but it's not, it takes too long. I mean, you know, my time span isn't for so long. It's longer than the computer, you know, <laughs> media, but it's not that long. So I use wash and acrylic to experiment, and I use oil to really, to really kind of convey my message when I think it's, when I think I've, I've accomplished something. So, um, but what I, what I'm doing right now is that I'm working on an oil. I'm trying to complete this last oil painting that I had started before I was interrupted by my collector who wanted me to do something and it took me 
a while to say yes. And then I said it, and he said, no, that's not what I wanted. Yes, we are. And then I went crazy, and then I went back and did it, and then he took it, thank God. <laughs> but but uh, I'm trying to switch over, so I'm finishing off this oil painting. And now I'm going to, I want, I want to experiment with a commercial uh, thing, what is usually used in uh, commercial uh, advertisement, uh, the optical illusion mm. on a two-dimensional surface. I want, if I can, I want to try to play with that. Now, Dolly, it's nothing new. Dolly did it, but he did it minutely and just flaunted and went on about his business. I want to take it and see if I can push it to to a level. That optical illusion. You know what an optical illusion is? When you look at a sign or something and it looks like it's moving. It's stagnated, the lines are done, so it looks like it's twirling, or, or if you move it, it moves. Well, I want to play with that, but, so I'm going to go play with some acrylic on that. Work that would be my next little project for myself. As I continue to to uh, project this whole uh, philosophy of the universe, the source of creativity, femininity. Yes. Are you meaning also like even like subliminal advertising? Yeah, well, it, it's a it's it's a it's a technique that's used in advertising. Well, I see, there was a guy in the uh, '80s that one of them was talking about advertising and how how like uh, liquor ads, you know, certain ads had like you know uh, right. imagery that was subliminal that you would catch up. Right. Yeah. Are it's you, similar. Are you, okay. It's sim Yeah, that's what okay. I'm playing with. But I want to take it someplace else, and I think if I can take it to the place I want to take it, then you'll get my message easier and quicker. You know, that one on the other side of that column has a wonderful sense of nature to it. Uh, it's almost like the, the, the doors of, uh, I don't know, like, uh, like toward King Kong, you know, like with the, you know, that, that, that one, it, it, there's something so... Oh, they're yeah, numinous. Yeah, 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 yeah. On the other side, you can't see it because it's on the other side of the column. Anyway, right, right. Yeah, but it's almost like, a, like it's... Uh, uh, Cavernous nature door. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. you talking about three blades on the other side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three blades. Yeah. And that's that's scary. Little... <laughs> that's scary. 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 <laughs> which one's your favorite? What? Yeah. <laughs> I said, which one's your favorite? Which one is my favorite? The one I'm working on now. Oh, really? It's the next one. It's the next one. It's the one that I haven't even got to. You know, once I get there completed, it's okay, next. Yep. Did the message next, I gotta make it better. It's gotta be better. Every time it's gotta be better. Mm -hmm. I reach for better, higher, higher, higher. Like I'm insatiable, I can't get enough. <laughs> How do you get better? You get better by doing it. By doing it and in, in, in questioning and challenging. You know, okay, I can do it, but can you do it better? I did it, I did it, I see I did it, and I did it, I repeat it, but that's not good enough. Now do, do it again and make it better than those repeats. Are there any um, like self-development techniques? Uh, do you take classes? Do you have a mentor? Uh, not, at this, yeah. <laughs> not at this point. Not at this Yeah, what truth of the matter is there is. I, I go, I use the Google, I uh -huh. go on the internet and I, I stroll. You know what, what the development technique is? To go back to art history. I go back there a lot. I go back there a lot. I mean, you know, I just, uh, because I paint still lives and you know still lives came from the Dutch. Dutch painters was the one who created still lives. I mean, you know, bottom line in painting, in the fine arts, still life painting is the lower of the wrong. First it was the mythological, then it was the portrait, then it was the landscape, and then it was the still life. And the still life didn't come into vogue until the Dutch came in, with Rembrandt, you know, Vermeer, and those guys. They were one who, they are the, and of course it didn't lost its momentum as we move through time and get to the impressionists and not only down to down to whatever. So we all use certain aspects of it. But what I do to answer the question is that I go back to art history and I start searching out and I see, pick up little things that I didn't quite understand when I was being taught. I, Conrad Fiedler tells you how to be critical about art and I read him and 
twist my brain, then I go get this Jean Paul Sartre and try to read him. I've been trying to read that book for 15 years. <laughs> Six, 15, 20 years, and I still haven't come to I haven't got through the introduction, huh? Uh, uh, being in nothingness. Jean Paul Sartre. But that that's 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 where I get that, that whole thing. It's like, okay. They, they're saying something here, and I'm, I'm saying something too. I can't write, but I can paint, so I'm gonna paint it. Have you ever wanted to exper experiment in like other mediums, or have you? Other than washing the acrylic, no, no. <laughs> I, um, I in oils, no. I tried out sculpture, and then it's like, ah, oh, it's no, no. I need to move those lines around, and I need to bring that color up and I need to paint it out and I need to push it back and make it come forward, you know. I mean, you know, that color, if you deal with that color wheel right, man, it's a dance. You can do whatever you want with it, go wherever you want it to go. I mean, you because know, the bottom line is your warm colors, you know, attract and your cool colors recede and if you can put them boys together right, with the compliments, they'll give you anything you want. You're very comfortable yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know, I, like I said, I studied with, with uh, come up under the old academy. They made you understand what you were trying to do. My teacher used to look at, I had one teacher, he said, man, you need to get that mess out of here. <laughs> if you don't know those tools, you can't make sure. <laughs> Right, right. You got to understand the tools, and, and, and you also understand the limitations of what, you know, what's going on. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything uh, for me? Oh, no. Thank you so much for coming. And I uh, really appreciate having you here. And Dad, I just want to give a round of applause to Relinda for making this available. <laughs> Yeah, my work. Thank you. Really. I can honestly sit and listen to you for another half hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have some wine and we're gonna yeah, sit you can have some wine, take a break, and we can talk. Listen to, to a little music, and, and nobody needs to run out. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.